Welcome to the Style Blues Podcast. This is where we talk about sewing a beautiful wardrobe and creating a beautiful home. If you have style blues, we can fix it. Your host is Jessica Kramer, apparel designer and blogger at chambrayblues.com. Listen in and let your blues disappear. Everybody, welcome back to the podcast. It's time for episode eight. We're going to talk a little bit about sewing rainwear. A while ago, I decided it'd be fun to try something completely different from my usual sewing projects. And with the rainy season here, I decided I wanted to try sewing a raincoat. So there are several different types of fabric you can use for rainwear. The general choices are either waterproof or water resistant, and they are not the same thing. So waterproof fabrics do not allow for any water penetration versus water resistant fabrics will repel some of the water. So to achieve a truly waterproof fabric requires two or three layers within the fabric. The material and an inner layer or layers are bonded together, usually by a high-tech process called ultrasonic wielding. Ultrasonic wielding is achieved by multiple panel edges being put together, pressed, infused with high levels of ultrasonic sound waves. The energy from the sound waves is transformed into heat, which permanently bonds the panels together. Usually they contain some sort of thermoplastic material, and it makes two or more panels into one solid panel with no holes whatsoever. The type of equipment that they use to do this is very expensive. And of course, the technicians to run the equipment also cost more than your average uh, person who would be working in a factory like that. And the cost of the fabric is reflected in the technology. It's interesting that science and technology have changed so much in the sewing world and we have such great high-tech options. And the result is we can have a completely waterproof fabric that is also breathable because of those inner layers. So I couldn't wait to try this out after I started looking into it and reading. I spent hours and hours uh, online just reading all the different options and looking at all the different fabric choices out there. And whoever thought that sewing was boring was so wrong because this is so not boring. This is really exciting. Uh, Fabrics that use this kind of technology, there's a bunch of them out there. There's Gore-Tex or two or three ply Ultratex, SWB Tex. Hydro Shield, Rip Stops, Storm Fit. Those are just some of the options. Okay. I'm sure there's probably more. Those are just ones that I came across in my research. So, for water resistant fabrics, the f- fibers are woven together very tightly. Water molecules are small enough that they can still pass through the fibers. It doesn't have a backing on it. So, light rainfall generally doesn't pass through those little pores since raindrops aren't always that small. But high water pressure from a constant downpour or even submersion will cause water to find its way through the fabric. So fabrics that are water resistant and are sometimes coated can be Toslon, micro suede, polyester, coated taffeta, ripstop, silkara, Weathermax 65 and 10 mile cloth. So those are some of the different choices that I came across. You can also use something like oil cloth. If you're living in a part of the world where you have access to that, we don't have access to it here, or it's pretty rare to find in the States. But for my projects, I decided to purchase two different type of fabrics because I wanted to see what they were like and how to work with them. So I decided on the water resistant two ply Ultratex, which is the bonded fabric that has the the backing on it. And then I also purchased a soft silky water resistant Silkara for my second project, which I haven't started yet, but that's going to be a totally different episode. We'll talk about that later. So where can you find fabric for these kinds of projects and what sort of other supplies will you need? Well, generally most waterproof jackets have snaps or grippers. They may have zippers on them. You can purchase waterproofing tape to completely waterproof seams after they've been sewn. You can use buttons on them. 
You can also get reflective material. If you're going to be out at night or early in the morning, I'd highly suggest adding some reflecting material to your garment so it makes you easier to see. Those are all kind of bells and whistles that you can add to your projects. Places where you can buy those fabrics. Well, I purchased mine from Seattle Fabrics. I decided in my mind they were the experts. They live in Seattle where it rains year round. I'm sure they know what they're doing. And uh, I've been really happy with them. But I also looked at fabric that was on fabrics.com, LA Finch, Mood. There are a bunch of different places out there. If you just Google rainwear fabric yardage, you'll come up with all kinds of different options. So let's talk a little bit about sewing techniques. Well, when I started working on my project, I learned really fast that waterproof fabrics are a completely different animal, completely different from any other sewing I've ever done. The main reason is you can't rip anything out. You can't rip out any stitches because the needle leaves holes in the fabric and then it's not waterproof anymore. That fabric is not going to close around a pinhole either for the same reason. If you choose to use a fabric such as a gabardine or a twill and then add waterproofing to it afterwards, that would be totally a different story. I also discovered very quickly that you cannot use fusible interfacing. It does not stick to Gore-Tex or fabrics that have a rubberized backing. And I experimented with it. At first, I thought I probably couldn't even iron the fabric. And with a low heat setting on my iron, I was able to do some ironing on it to, you know, press seams a little bit. It wasn't easy though. And with the interfacing, I tried using a press cloth and different heat settings and it stuck to the fabric for a short term. And then I I let my project sit for a few days before I came back to it to continue it. And by then the interfacing had let go from the fabric. So fusible interfacing just does not work. I would suggest that you use a sew-in interfacing for this type of project instead. All right, so my particular pattern that I decided on was a fairly roomy, it was an easy fit item. Uh, It had dolman sleeves and longer body. It was fairly loose. It wasn't a, wasn't a athletic piece of apparel. And I decided that I was glad I started with that because simple seems to be easier with this type of project. If you have a lot of fine details that you want to add, you know, some athletic wear can have all kinds of zippers and, you know, top stitching and stretch stitch, whatever, all that kind of stuff. And for this, I just decided to go with very simple. And I'm glad I did. It made the project go considerably better. My coat also has a lining to it, which was the lining is just a, thin piece of polyester. There's nothing fancy about it. It is slippery, however, and definitely hard to cut as most linings are. So use lots of pattern weights when you're cutting these things out and sharp scissors. Of course, you can use the pins on the regular lining fabric. You just cannot use them on the waterproof fabric. So you need lots of pattern weights for that. If you don't have pattern weights, you can use coffee cups or tin cans from your pantry or whatever you have on hand. I've seen people sew little bags of sand or little bags with rice in them to use as pattern weights. Uh, They all work. So buttons versus grippers. Uh, My coat had both options, actually. And I was at first going to do the grippers, and then I couldn't really find any that I liked locally, and I didn't want to wait around for them to be shipped to me. So I decided to go with the buttons. And that probably wasn't the best idea. The main reason, again, is that the fabric does not recover. If you do something wrong with your buttonhole, it is going to be there forever right in front of everybody down your the front of your jacket. So I did have a couple little mistakes with my buttonholes. The fabric kind of got stuck underneath the needle. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that here as we go along. All right. So the main thing with the, the fabric then is it has the rubber backing and then the smooth front. And I found that sewing on the right side, the smooth side was not a problem. It would slide through my sewing machine. It didn't stick to the presser foot. That was easy. However, most pieces, when you're 
putting a jacket together are sewn with right sides together. So in that case, you have the backing, the rubberized backing exposed to both the feed dog and to your presser foot. And that was a big problem. It sticks like glue, I tell you. It was hard to get through that machine. I just struggled and struggled with it. And I finally decided to try the walking foot, which made all the difference in the world. It helps feed the two pieces evenly under the needle makes a huge difference. I did also experiment with a piece of freezer paper folded over the seam and sew th- right through the paper and then pull the paper off afterwards. And that did work fairly well. It's a little bit cumbersome, but if you don't have a walking foot, that would be an option. You could also try wax paper is fairly slippery and that would work too. So the needle needs to be sharp, absolutely sharp. I would start with a new needle and perhaps even change needles halfway through the project just to be sure because it is dulling the needle every time it pokes through all that fabric. And I ended up using a size 14 for my project, which is just pretty much all purpose size needle. You could probably even go with a little bit heavier needle, uh, maybe a 16 or an 18. And your thread is important too. So I purchased the Gooderman thread from Seattle Fabrics when I ordered my fabric, which was great because I didn't have to go out and search for thread to match. They do that for you, which I thought was a great service. And my coat is yellow, so I got this great bright yellow thread that matched just right. I would highly recommend doing it that way. The thread was fabulous. I didn't have any trouble with thread breaking or knotting up, nothing like that. So Gooderman is, of course, great quality thread and it's definitely worth the extra expense to use a high quality thread when making a jacket. Uh, let's see. So obviously with the the sewing then, you can't rip out any stitches and you only get one chance to do things right. And that overall just makes it hard to work with. I had a couple of struggles around The hood of the jacket required some top stitching. I top stitched it the first time. I didn't like it. It wasn't even. There was a little pull in the fabric here, a little pull there, and I didn't like it. So I did take it out and restitch it. It's not completely obvious. And obviously this jacket for me was just an experiment. I don't care if it's not absolutely perfect. I'm still going to wear it and love it anyway because it fits great. But just a reminder, you can't take the fabric stitches out. So if you need to check your fit, I would highly recommend that you make a wearable muslin first to make sure that your garment is going to fit the way you want it to. And don't forget about the lining too. You need to have enough room in there for the lining. And sometimes you can have too little lining and that can cause problems with the fit also. So keep that in mind when you're working on your pattern pieces. So the pattern that I chose for my project was called the Waver Jacket. I have not sewn with a lot of PDF patterns. This was uh, what the second one that I've tried. I usually just stick with one of the name brands, but I really couldn't find the style coat that I was looking for. So I went with the PDF and overall it was a well-designed pattern. I did spot a couple of things that could have made this project turn out much better, however. And the biggest one for me was that the center front wasn't cut on the straight grain. Now, I noticed it when I was laying out the fabric, and I thought with the waterproof fabric, it wouldn't make a difference if the center front wasn't on the straight grain. However, it does. It makes a huge difference. It's such a small detail, but generally, if you have buttons or grippers going down the center front, it's got to be on the straight grain. So what happened is the grain line was kind of midway between the center front and the side seam. And that gives you all this extra fabric at center front. It's like putting a flare right down your center front. So when my coat is hanging on me or on the mannequin, it has this big wad of fabric in the front and the buttons or grippers are hidden down inside the fabric. It looks rather awkward. So that would be the one change I would make. I would put the buttons or the center front on the grain for a better drape. So that was the the main thing 
The other one was the pocket placement. I followed the placement on the pockets that came with the pattern. And I did alter my pattern slightly. I made it bigger around. I added some fullness at the sides. And that kind of makes the pockets off their placement just a little bit. They're very close to the center front. I would have moved them over at least two inches closer to the side seam if I could have moved them. But of course, I can't because... They are already stitched on there, and I'm not going to put more holes in my coat. So they're there for eternity. The next one I make, though, I would definitely move them closer to the side seam. And then there's the lining. So overall, I didn't have any problems with the lining. However, I do feel that the lining should have been longer. It should have had a longer hem. Most coats, good quality coats, have what's called a jump hem. And that is a hem that's at least a half an inch or even an inch longer in length. And it's almost like a little pleat inside the coat at the hemline. And what happens is when you're wearing the jacket and you lift your arms or you're moving, it gives you extra room to keep the jacket hanging straight and doesn't make the hem pull up as you move around. So this coat wasn't designed this way. And I discovered too late that the hem pulls up in kind of an unattractive manner when I'm moving about. If I make it again, I'll add an extra inch to the lining. But for now, I stitched the hem of the lining independently from the jacket. And that gives me that extra freedom to move without affecting the way it's hanging. So overall, it was definitely a challenging project. The fabric was not easy to work with, but I am still pleased with it. It is comfortable. It does breathe. It fits overall quite well. And my main purpose, you know, as I said, would be for just walking in the rain or working in the yard on wet days. So it's okay if there are a few little details that didn't quite work out the way that I thought. So I do have a complete tutorial for this on my website, chambrayblues.com. If you'd like to see the pictures of the jacket, you can check out the show notes. I will link to it in the show notes, and I'll put the links also to the resources that I used for the fabric for this project. So I will have more rainwear projects coming up. I said I have uh, one more to do, and it'll be kind of a different style coat, more of a dress coat, and we'll see how that one goes together by comparison. So that's all for today. I'm so glad you're here. I appreciate you tuning in and If you enjoyed this podcast, please take the time to leave me just a little review on iTunes. That would be awesome. So that's it for now. You have a great day. Keep on sewing. You are listening to the Style Blues Podcast. If you have questions about this episode, you can contact us by email, info at chambrayblues.com or visit our Chambray Blues Sewing Patterns and Tutorials Facebook page and group. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Until next time, style those blues.